Good morning. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Celia Menchel, Chair of the Club's member-led Middle East Forum. I'd like to give a special thank you to the Washington Post and Laura Sitrakian for assistance with this program, and a very special thank you to Dr. Leila Alieva, who joined us this morning at 7 a.m. at the very last minute. And I'd also like to send um, my best wishes to Zahar Shiriev for a speedy recovery. He cannot be with us today. The next Middle East Forum event is on December the 9th. It's called The Impact of COVID-19 on Refugees, um, particularly Syrian, Iraqi, and um, Kurdish refugees. There are millions of them, as we all know. But um, um, you can find out more about this program and other events at commonwealthclub.org. Before I turn the program over to Eddie Simonian, our distinguished moderator and vice chair of the um, member-led forum, I'd like to show a three-minute video, a YouTube video, about our today's subject. I chose it because it's concise, three minutes, and I hope it's helpful and informative. Thank you. In April 2016, Armenia and Azerbaijan opened fire on one another, rekindling a bloody war over their borders. The two countries have been rivals since their founding nearly a century ago, and even after more than a dozen ceasefires have repeatedly clashed over long-standing regional disputes. So why do Armenia and Azerbaijan hate each other? Well, the two were actually once part of a larger country, the Transcaucasian Federation. In the aftermath of World War I, this country divided into modern-day Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, all three of which were integrated into the Soviet Union. Within Azerbaijan, the USSR created an autonomous region for ethnic Armenians called Nagorno-Karabakh. Some historians speculate that Joseph Stalin deliberately included this region in Azerbaijan to appease Turkey, hoping that the country would one day become communist. Broader consensus, however, suggests that the decision was part of Stalin's divide and rule strategy, thus ensuring Armenian cooperation with the Soviet Union. Nagorno-Karabakh is still a highly disputed territory and the crux of their modern feud. Throughout the 20th century, Nagorno-Karabakh made several attempts to unite with Armenia as their population is by and large ethnically Armenian. Seeing the weakening of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, Nagorno-Karabakh held a referendum declaring themselves a sovereign state. However, Azerbaijan promptly rejected that, leading to a six-year war between the two countries. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians fled Azerbaijan and vice versa, and both sides have accused each other of war crimes, including ethnic cleansing and mutilation. An estimated 30,000 lives were lost on both sides. By 1994, Armenian forces had taken control of Nagorno-Karabakh and much of the surrounding territory, leaving Azerbaijan about 15% smaller. After a Russian-brokered ceasefire that same year, the war officially ended, and Nagorno-Karabakh claimed de facto independence. But despite the agreement, sporadic violence continued, the largest of which broke out in early 2016. Today, Nagorno-Karabakh remains under Armenian separatist control. The region is relatively small and is only home to roughly 150,000 people, nearly all of which are ethnically Armenian. Technically, the country is still part of Azerbaijan. Although Nagorno-Karabakh declared independence, the claim has not been recognized by any country, including Armenia. Since the end of the war, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Nagorno-Karabakh have accepted a number of ceasefire agreements. Each one has been broken, however, some within minutes of their signing. Azerbaijan has refused to negotiate the future of Nagorno-Karabakh until Armenia pulls its troops out of the region. But Armenia will not withdraw forces until there is some form of resolution creating a frozen conflict. Further complicating the matter are Armenia and Azerbaijan's respective allies, Russia and Turkey. As a majority Christian country, Armenia is supported by Russia and much of the West, including the United States. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, enjoys close ties with Turkey as both are majority Muslim, and Turkey is a longtime enemy of Armenia. With no clear solution or foreseeable end to this conflict, world powers have generally taken a back seat until circumstances force them to act. Until they do, the danger of yet another violent uprising will continue to plague the two nations. Tensions between Armenia and Turkey date back to the Ottoman Empire. At the heart of their turbulent relationship is what is controversially known as the Armenian Genocide. You can learn more about that in our video at the top. And to find out why Turkey and other nations still deny the Armenian Genocide, check out our video at the bottom. 
Thanks for watching Test Tube News, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos from us every day. I'll be your moderator for today's program, the Nagorno-Karabakh Dilemma. Today's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. We invite everyone to visit us online at www.commonwealthclub.org. This program will also be available soon on YouTube. A reminder to please send your questions for the Q&A period to the chat on YouTube. We learned this morning that uh, Zawer Shuryev will be unable to join us due to illness, but thanks to Lara Sitrakian's assistance, Dr. Leila Alieva will be taking his place. I'm excited to introduce our panelists for today who have an in-depth understanding of the region and will be able to shed light on the most current developments that are occurring on the ground. Lara Sitrakian, journalist and CEO of News Deeply. Dr. Leila Alieva, Russian and Eastern European Studies affiliate Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, and Jason Rezaian, Washington Post columnist and CNN contributor. We will begin with Lara Sitrakian, who is based in Armenia. Please welcome Lara. Thank you so much, Eddie. It was, it was certainly a loss not to have Zaur Shiriev with us uh, from the Crisis Group, a fantastic organization, a fantastic mind who was going to set the scene a bit. So I will try to step in and do that. Um, I do feel very grateful that the, Dr. Leila Aliyeva is able to join us. So you saw some of the background there in uh, the video. Let me bring it up to the present moment to, as best I can. And Dr. Aliyeva, I'm sure, will also fill in anything that I've missed. So uh, on September 27 of this year, what had basically been a frozen conflict, a stalemate, uh, completely evaporated. So uh, a war was fought over Nagorno-Karabakh from 1992 to 1994. Armenia basically won that war, held the territory and started building up um, what local ethnic Armenians described as the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, later renamed as the Republic of Artsakh. And so over time, Armenians got very comfortable with that situation, and that left a lot of discomfort on the Azeri side. There were Azeris who used to live in that territory who wanted to go home. Um, there were all kinds of, of course, identity and territorial uh, desires of, of Azerbaijan that were not being met by Armenia sort of t in a winner-take-all situation. Uh, the rest of the world stepped up, the US, France, and Russia co-chaired this negotiations track called the OSCE Minsk Group to try to bring all parties to an agreement. There were some very big moments in American diplomacy there uh, where the US really led the effort to find a durable, sustainable peace, but it never really happened. A deal was never signed. And so this little plot of land remained up in the air in terms of the international community, in terms of the, the realities on the ground. Um, in, in September of this year, Azerbaijan basically said to the world, we are not okay with this. 26 years of a stalemate is not okay. Uh, and basically broke away from negotiations and said very explicitly, we're going to decide this on the ground. We're going to finish this issue on the ground. Um, Turkey very much in support of that position. Uh, so Turkey, Azerbaijan, uh, and a number of, of sort of uh, allies coming in and just deciding we're starting this war over again, and this time we want to win it. Uh, it was extremely brutal from September 26 until November 10 of this year, an extremely brutal war. Um, Azerbaijan had clearly better firepower, more manpower, um, and a lot of strategic advantages on the ground. Uh, they prevailed on November 10. Turkey and Russia basically came up with what, what is their version of a ceasefire. Um, the U.S. pretty much held back from any serious engagement. France, the other co-chair, wasn't able to do much given the dynamics on the ground. And what you had is very similar to what happened essentially at the dawn of the Soviet Union, where Turkish-Russian war dynamics and power dynamics dictated the outcomes on the ground. And so there was a, a ceasefire on November 10, very much um, reflecting the fact that Azerbaijan basically won this war, uh, thousands dead on each side, uh, a national tragedy here in Armenia. I'm based in Yerevan, and it's a, basically a period of national mourning. And this ceasefire that came down on November 10 was winner-take-all in a, almost, you know, in Armenian 
in the Armenian mind, winner take all in the other direction. So Azerbaijan made major gains, um, but the deal basically was so hastily described, it was a bit of, of splitting Solomon's baby. Uh, Azerbaijan gets part of Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia gets part of Nagorno-Karabakh, Russian peacekeepers come in on the ground, which is something that neither party necessarily wanted. So now Russia has a really serious security foothold in the Southern Caucasus. Um, both peoples, I think, feel a little bit cheated by the terms of this deal, but it wasn't the sort of subtle peacemaking that you might hope for. Um, it sets the scene. Sometimes people say at the end of the last war, you're really setting the conditions for the next war. And that, I fear, may be true. Um, there's all sorts of wild cards in the mix. Russia has promised Azerbaijan basically a highway across Armenia that hasn't really been well defined, but so that it can connect to Nafichevan and Turkey, which was sort of one of those conditions on the table in the past, but didn't the execution isn't clear, nothing is clear. Just this sort of huge, huge ceasefire conditions were put down without much detail. So now we're in the middle of this period of the unknown where Russia, Turkey, and others are sort of figuring out what does this ceasefire deal really mean? On the, on the bright side, it stopped the fighting and bloodletting on both sides. On the negative side, nothing was really truly settled. There isn't a, a calm, sustainable peace. Both populations in Armenia and Azerbaijan have lost so much uh, in terms of their sons, in terms of um, the pain of the past six to seven weeks, uh, but they're also really riled up. Nobody prepared them for this ceasefire. There isn't really a lot of optimism that these two people can live together in peace or that even building bridges right now um, is going to be very, very difficult. Armenians are extremely concerned about the fate of their people, of the, their identity on that land. They've lived there for centuries. They're also worried about the fate of their churches and monasteries, some of them dating back from the foundation of Christianity. Um, this region doesn't have a good track record of taking care of historical monuments when they fall into, so to speak, enemy hands. So Armenians are very concerned. The patriarch, basically the Pope of the Armenian church, wrote an op-ed this week about uh, how concerned he was about fourth century monasteries, uh, first century relics, and what will happen to them. And one of the responses back on the Azeri side that I've heard is, well, how, well, how did you take care of our stuff after you after we left the region? What about our mosques? What about our artifacts? And they're right, uh, frankly. You know, this is it's almost like the fight in a microcosm. In a perfect world, you'd have cooler heads come together and say, you know what, this stops here. No more destruction of each other's heritage. Okay, we don't love each other, but we've got to find a better way. That is a pipe dream right now. There, that would be a miraculous sort of coming together if the region could see that happen. So, you know, before I was sort of stepping into Zaur's shoes to set the scene, there were a number of things I wanted to make sure to convey. I'm speaking in a personal capacity, I'm a journalist, but I've certainly been exposed to the Armenian narrative and thought pattern my entire life as a member of the Ar Armenian American diaspora. So, you know, I wanna share a few notes from that perspective. You know, I do think this war was a catastrophe for both peoples. Um, I think I'm very sad for I'm very sad for the civilians who died on both sides. I've sent my condolences to the people I know um, who felt really impacted when you know Armenian missiles hit cities in Azerbaijan, and of course, as Azerbaijan basically pummeled the cities of Nagorno-Karabakh into submission, uh, cluster bombs, white phosphorus. I mean, really seriously bad stuff. Um, which leads me to really the three things. I think are most important for non-Armenians, non-Azeris to know about what's going on right now. One is that we're back to the law of the jungle. You know, the message here is that breaking away from negotiations and brute forcing it is back on the table, which you could have said that was the case when you see a lot of, even a lot of conflict zones, but you know, there was a diplomatic process here that was supposed to hold. There was a negotiations track that all this stuff was supposed to work. Um, the U.S. backed out, didn't lead. These things are built for the U.S. to lead. Uh, the U.S. Minsk Group process is built for U.S. leadership alongside France and Russia. And so when the West backs out, it really becomes a test of force. And so that's, that's really quite dangerous and really scary. When it's law of the jungle, anything goes. Norms are out the window. Restrictions are out the window. Whoever, whoever can brute force it will basically dictate the terms of the, of the next century. Uh, and that's, that's a sad realization. Uh, the second thing out of three that I think are important to highlight, you know, Russia and Turkey are now writing the future of this region. Um, I think that's really says something during 
During the Syrian conflict, we talked as the U.S. about outsourcing this to the to our regional allies. That doesn't always work out very well um, because it becomes more about a trading of interests. I think Carnegie, I believe, wrote a great. There's a great thinkers on this. We can share with the Commonwealth Club, Tom DeWall, um, Lawrence Bors at Chatham House, and, and one of them wrote that you know basically Turkey and Russia are having their interests factored in. Armenia and Azerbaijan, not so much. This isn't about the people anymore and what's going to build a better future for them. This is about the interests of regional powers and what they're going to be comfortable uh, doing. I sometimes say in my analysis, uh, these are powers that like to create problems that only they can solve, which gives them a real upper hand in dictating the terms of the peace. And that's basically what happened here. Uh, and the third thing, I'm sorry to say, the, but it's certainly the lesson that Armenians are taking away from this, is that democracies are at a disadvantage. Armenia was a two-year-old democracy, a peaceful revolution swept away the old Soviet guard, um, but that let them, left them very ill-prepared. Uh, I think Azerbaijan executed this war brilliantly. They had incredibly good strategy, good military technology, great messaging, great everything. Uh, and they had a it was a long-term investment. Uh, the, the government in, in Azerbaijan has been in power since the start, the dawn of the country's existence after the Soviet Union. Um, Haider Aliyev was in some form of authority since 1964 during the Soviet period. That's actually a strategic advantage. You can plan for things. You get a lot of experience. Young democracies, are, you know, certainly Armenians in this young democracy, feel that democracies didn't back us up. We don't have oil wealth. Um, and our institutions were just kicking off. We were moving in a more democratic direction, uh, but that didn't leave them in a position of strength when it comes to waging war. So a lot of, you know, a lot of hard realities that are sinking in here in Armenia. As I said, it's a time of national mourning. Uh, it has definitely kicked up a lot of the uh, fears and existential dread of the past that, you know, basically, if you look at the most extreme things that people in Turkey and Azerbaijan have been saying over these seven weeks, you would shudder with fear, if anyone would. I don't believe that that represents the full and true picture of Turks and Azerbaijanis. But if but Armenians are sitting here looking at the leader of Azerbaijan talk about running us out like dogs, um, and worse, frankly, I mean, terrible, terrible hate speech. In San Francisco, a church building was torched, was arson, you know, we saw to go up in flames. The Armenian school in San Francisco was graffitied on in the past year. That The diaspora of Armenians in, in the Bay Area rightfully shudder when they think people were a target. And now this war. So this has left a very deep psychological scar. And part of my work as a humanitarian is going to be trying to help my people come out of this and shed some of that trauma uh, instead of just passing it on to the next generation or just being the walking wounded for, for many years to come. So this was a really, really bad thing for everyone involved, and the rest of the world has reason to worry about the implications. Thank you so much, Laura. That was very, very insightful. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Leila Alieva, who is based in London. Uh, I truly want to thank Dr. Alieva for being able to join. Uh, as we mentioned, this was last minute, so thank you so much, Dr. Alieva. Uh, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I share Lara's uh, grief and um, a deep uh, concern and uh, sadness about the war. I similarly don't approve and don't um, support a military way of resolution. I also would like to say that I'm not speaking in the capacity of the uh, employee of my <clears throat> institute in Oxford. Uh, neither I'm uh, expressing the official view of uh, the government of Azerbaijan. I am um, actually consider this conflict absurd. And as a person who grew up in Baku, uh, which used to be very multinational, surrounded by Armenians and uh, Armenian friendship, at all levels, at all generations, both of the parents and myself, I still view this conflict as based on totally constructed fears, threats, and uh, concepts. Because if you look into history, you will see much greater, longer periods 
of coexistence, intermingling, intermarriages, friendships, and cooperation between the peoples, and much shorter periods of uh, conflicts which were erupting during the collapses of big empires. Um, so um, my attitude probably is different in terms of view is different as uh, of a person who, whose uh, development was closely connected to Armenians. Um, and that's why I view diversity and Armenians as neighbors, as part of my milieu, I view it as an enrichment um, because there is so much to benefit from each other. Um, the other thing is that we're very similar. If you go to the restaurant, and I've been to Yerevan after the conflict erupted a few times with a peacemaking mission, if you go to the restaurant, you would think that you're in the restaurant in Azerbaijan because exactly the same music is played and people are dancing absolutely the same dances. Um, then they look very much similar. And actually their traditions are very similar too. So um, maybe that's what Freud used to call the, um, the narcissism of small differences, but um, in a sense that gives you a big sort of, um, optimism regarding on the uh, you know future of this regarding the future of the relationship between uh, nations unfortunately we were caught in the vicious circle of the threats and wrong policy actions which uh, would be a sort of path dependency thing once it's on the path it would reinforce itself within the region, within between the nations, then within the region, but also within the broader international environment, which would not actually help to deconstruct the um, these threats, um, and um, which I consider is the legacy of the Soviet times. Um, the legacies are based at basically in, in two. I consider that these are two directions. First is um, that um, people, uh, peoples in the Caucasus lost sense of interdependency because they used to be part of the empire and their relationship were mediated by Moscow. So there is no sense that you know, there is a dependence between the political and economic uh, aspects of relations. So uh, you can benefit actually from normal normalizing relationship with the neighbor uh, because there is always a reliance that, you know, there is there can be a Moscow, Brussels or Washington which put pressure on the neighbor and then we can benefit anyway, even if we uh, sort of uh, conduct not very friendly policy. So what happened in this uh, 26 years is that there was certain asymmetry in the uh, status quo. And the asymmetry was, uh, of course, with the advantage, military advantage of Armenians who were uh, occupying uh, 15, 17 percent of the territory, Azerbaijani territory. But in spite of the UN resolutions, four UN resolutions, which immediate, were immediate upon the uh, movement of uh, Armenian army across the borders, uh, there were four UN resolutions. Um, none of them were implemented. Moreover, uh, the, uh, the military uh, achievements or uh, the military uh, element of this aspect was not delegitimized in the uh, peace process. It was actually empowered and legitimized as the uh, bargaining tool in the uh, talks. So as a result, due to the um, legitimization of the military element, 
this process left open uh, the um, military, any military adventure or the military way as the way to address the issue there. So basically sending the signals that if you uh, uh, get the territories back by force, then you'll be in more advantageous positions position during the talks. So this is one uh, of the problems, which I call normative uncertainty. And of course, the, everyone expects that EU, US, or Western actor in general is the one who brings normative element to the region. You don't expect it from Russia or from any other uh, actor that they will bring the normative uh, um, element to this conflict. You, you still expect that the West will be an arbiter who will bring the sense of justice, you know, the law and uh, everything with it. Um, but it didn't happen. Uh, so I think the pr major problem with Azerbaijani side was that there was this humanitarian emergency created by the occupation, 700,000 people displaced. And believe me, it's a big number. Uh, I was absolutely astonished by discovering so many IDPs around me. I never knew they were IDPs, but they were very happy when they heard that they uh, lands were liberated and now they come back. Some of them kept the keys from their houses, which they were had to leave. So um, this is uh, the humanitarian emergency, which nobody addressed, unfortunately. And um, I think that was the pressing issue, which eventually, uh, uh, together with normative uncertainty and legitimization of the military element in the uh, uh, negotiations, I think these two combination of two issues uh, allowed this conflict to erupt in such a uh, brutal uh, way as it happened recently. Uh, there are other factors, of course, which promoted uh, the violation of the ceasefire right now. I mean, COVID is one of these factors. Withdrawal of the energy companies from the region. The other factor, uh, the series of policy acts uh, on the Armenian side, you know, uh, when Pashinyan uh, danced Yali in Shusha. Shusha is a very sensitive place because it was, first of all, uh, majority of Azeris live that live there. This is very important uh, symbolic uh, place for Azerbaijani as culture and history. Um, so some other uh, policy uh, steps. So altogether, I think it created this very unfortunate um, situation, which we'll have to deal with. And the problem is that <laughs> the initial, um, the initial image and dreams of the Caucasus to become a sort of region of independent, strong and democratic states, it's tremendously failed. Azerbaijan has been resisting Russian troops for 30 years. In 1992, uh, President Bey, um refused all the Russian forces. He said, we can't be independent having Russian troops on our soil in 1992. And then it cost me his, it cost him his power. He, Azerbaijan was the first country which got rid of all the troops from its territory. Uh, even I think earlier than the Germany, Germany from Russian troops, uh, Soviet troops. Um, but unfortunately in a year time, uh, IHB was, uh, out of his power with the help of Russian uh, forces. Um, so uh, we now back to the zero point. Unfortunately, uh, presence of Russian so-called peacekeeping troops means the direct control over both situation in Armenia, domestic situation in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. Russian troops also can have the uh, influence uh, via 
the again the stirring the conflict whenever it's a right time when it feels that's the right time now we have turkey involved so we ended up with a regionalization of confrontation uh, whether it will be transition period or a long term period we still have to see thank you thank you so much uh, dr leila We'd like to remind our audience that this is a Commonwealth Club program called the Nagorno-Karabakh Dilemma with Lara Sitrakian, journalist and CEO of News Deeply, Dr. Leila Alieva, Russian and Eastern European Studies affiliate, Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, Jason Rezaian, Washington Post columnist and CNN contributor. I am Eddie Simonian, today's moderator. Now it's time for the Q&A period. We have a large number of questions, so let's begin. We'll begin the Q&A period with a couple of questions directed to Jason Rezaian, who is a Washington Post columnist and CNN contributor. Uh, Jason, I'm gonna ask you a, a bit of a broad question, so please take your time uh, answering it. Uh, could you please offer a broader context for the conflict, regional impact, and of course, the view from Washington, DC? Sure. First, I want to thank um, Commonwealth Club for, for hosting this today and, and applaud them for doing this. This is not a conversation that, that we're having uh, very much in Washington. Uh, and this is a conflict that's happening in real time. Uh, real lives are being affected. And it's the sort of thing that uh, in normal uh, Washington circumstances, uh, we would be talking about much more openly and, and robustly. And I, and I think Laura uh, and Dr. Aliyeva for, for getting us up to date on what's happening in, in, in both of these countries, because uh, as a representative of the American media, I'm always disappointed that we don't hear more about what's going on uh, in the rest of the world. And we're living through a moment right now where we're so uh, laser focused on what's happening within our own borders, our own cities, our own communities, that we forget about these important issues that are happening around the world. I, I think for me that the headline is that this has been an unnecessary gift for authoritarians. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a moment in time where uh, U.S. leadership really could have helped uh, in, in bringing some uh, stability to the situation uh, and, and creating a, a peace uh, or at least a framework uh, for a piece that, that might last. Uh, as both Lara and Dr. Alieva have uh, so eloquently told us, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, that Russia and Turkey are the main arbiters of the situation at this point does not bode well for either one of these countries, neither uh, Armenia or Azerbaijan. Uh, these are not independent-minded uh, actors in this conflict. So, uh, I, I think that it's a, it's a huge loss that the U.S. hasn't been more involved in uh, in these discussions, but that's par for the course for this administration. Uh, there wasn't a, a possibility that um, as entrenched as they are in their own um, projects in, in other parts of the world, uh, that they were going to take this one uh, seriously. Uh, that being said, uh, there are other actors involved, right? You know, uh, Iran shares borders with, with both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijanis are the largest ethnic minority in Iran, make up about 40% of the population. Uh, so this is a conflict that's taking place in a neighborhood uh, surrounded by predatory actors. And, uh, and that's, that's bad news for everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I, I want to maybe just go a bit deeper. And, and you, you mentioned Iran, you mentioned the region. I do want to ask a question about religion, if you could uh, answer that. Uh, can we talk a bit about maybe the absurdity of some of the alliances within this conflict, whether Israel and Azerbaijan, uh, Iran and Armenia, Turkey and Azerbaijan, especially when we look at the religions, Turkey Sunni, Azerbaijan Shia, Armenia, Christian. So if you could please uh, talk a bit more yeah, yeah. about that. Uh, my two co-panelists to chime in after I say what I say, but Azerbaijan uh, is a, a majority Shia country. Uh, obviously, Iran is as well. Uh, ethnically, it's a Turkic country with deep cultural connections uh, to Turkey. Turkey's obviously 
a, a Sunni nation. Armenia is, is a pocket of Christianity uh, in that part of the world, one of the oldest branches of Christianity. Um, and and as, you, as we've talked about, and, and the, the images are available of, of these churches dating back, you know, more than a thousand years uh, in, in the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh territory um, are um, sort of uh, very important reminders of the deep history uh, and religious importance uh, of this, uh, this region. So, you know, I, I think that uh, religion is, is, is not the main impetus of this conflict, this land. But, uh, but ultimately, um, these differences, these subtle differences, as Dr. Aliyev uh, spoke so uh, clearly on, you know, the, the interdependency and, and mixing of, of these cultures goes way back. But in moments of conflict, differences are the things that we focus on uh, to kind of exasperate those crises. And I, I, I'd like to lob it to both of them, you know, because they're living it. I couldn't agree yeah, more. Please, please go ahead, guys. Yeah, I think religion is a victim of this war, frankly, um, because there are plenty of uh, Azeris you talk to who say they have no problem with Christians, and we've got Christians here in Azerbaijan. You have Armenians who have a deep love and appreciation for Islam from so many so many centuries of coexistence. Um, the Prophet Muhammad actually has a very strong track record of loving and protecting Armenians. Um, Rumi in Turkey has a long track record of loving and mentioning Armenians. And that's not forgotten. But then you also have, you know, I was just corresponding with some evangelical friends of mine who have Christian friends in Azerbaijan. We were talking about Christians across the region. And they're saying, well, at first they couldn't call themselves Christians because people in Azerbaijan automatically equate that with being Armenian. And if they have an ethnic hatred for Armenian, so we didn't want them to come after us. And Armenians, certainly there are some here who are who use the word Muslim synonymously with Azeris and Turks who they group all together and see us coming after them with, you know, wanting to wipe out all the Armenians. So, you know, I think religion has gotten swept up in all of these animosities and it's really a shame. I am personally devoting a big part of my life to Christian Muslim interfaith dialogue. And so I can see how absurd it is from one direction, but we're going to have to ratchet down the ethnic rhetoric uh, before we can detangle what, you know, this completely and take the religion out of it. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Dr. Leila, do you have any comments uh, on this portion? Yeah, because I found very interesting what Jason said about the um, siding of Europe with Armenia on the religious basis, which is probably yeah. partly true, yeah. because uh, the Azerbaijanis only now started to discover this element. They don't understand um, because they're coming from a very secular background. Azerbaijan, uh, compared to Armenia and Georgia in the region, the most secular. So there was a study. So um, uh, there is a much less number of people who are actively um, uh, practice. And um, so uh, basically, it's very interesting what you said. And uh, basically, uh, Eddie um, anticipated my question when you said about this religious element. Um, so now it's uh, a full picture, indeed. And I think the religion here is quite... Uh, strongly instrumentalized. It's used in um, sort of promotion of certain narrative to get the uh, in uh, official propaganda to get more sort of uh, support in the public opinion. So it's being actively exploited while it is not at the, at the root causes of the conflict. Conflict is about, as you can uh, um, correctly notice, it's about territory, but it's also about sense of discrimination. It's sense of that someone is trying to achieve uh, its goals at the expense of the others. So it's sort of a win-lose situation, which I also think is coming from the Soviet uh, legacy, mentality of Soviet legacy, because we can look at the heritage, religious heritage, from a different angle. We actually uh, live in the region which has the oldest um, 
history of Christianity, and we all, believe me or not, we are ancestors of that culture. We're bearing that culture. Even if we don't speak the language which was written there or not, we're all having elements of this culture in our DNA or whatever. So um, this is the other angle to look at it because we have common early Christianity uh, heritage, which we all should take care of rather than trying to find differences. I mean, we should be, that's why I, I think there are uh, permanent clashes and to disputes between Georgians and Armenians over temples and uh, churches, between Azerbaijanis and what they call the Albanians church and uh, Armenians. So there are all sorts of, which I find quite funny in a sense, because instead of looking at them as our common uh, past, and the access to these uh, monuments is not just a uh, uh, in one dimension or something, there are so many ways to make an easy access to the monuments and to the keep them safe and everything. So uh, I think the main um, uh, role of the Western community would be just to show the different perspective on the things for the peoples of the Caucasus uh, in uh, con contrary to what, for instance, uh, Russia is trying to do or others, not to exacerbate the difference, but rather show that we can do it in cooperation and we have something to share if we go really back, back in the past. I think personally, now that Azerbaijan has prevailed on the battlefield, I honestly think this is President Aliyev's opportunity to be a statesman and basically say the end of cultural destruction because, you know, so much Armenian heritage in, and these are not fully connected, but they're somewhat connected. They're definitely connected in the Armenian mind, but, you know, Armenian churches used to be peppered across uh, Turkey when we, and in a multi-ethnic, you know, none of these regions were ever hundred percent anything. Um, and that's a myth, but, you know, we all did coexist, and but a lot of that heritage, those monasteries, they are in ruins now. And in Nafichevan, which is an Azeri territory, thousands of monuments, precious monuments, um, were basically destroyed up until 2006. And now I understand, I never knew this part of the history, but again, there were so many mosques, so many Azeri heritage points and homes in Nagorno-Karabakh that were far from taken care of the past 30 years when Armenia controlled the, the territory. I don't, I have to learn that history and I really feel terrible for anything that was tampered with or, and, you know, I would offer my personal apology, not that I don't go very far. Um, but I think it would be really remarkable if, you know, if Aliyev stood up and said, okay, the cultural destruction stops now. And also the renaming of things. Some of this is the politics of renaming as well. And that's, you know, a lot of monuments in Eastern Turkey now, that were Armenian built, say they were built by somebody else. So they were built, you know, and there's plenty of plenty of scholarship. I don't have to be the one to debate who built them. There's plenty of scholarship inscriptions on them, but there's also this sort of, it's become a political point and people like to rub it in each other's noses. From what I understand, there was a, a article out that the mosque that was renovated by Armenians was, was renovated more in sort of Iranian style than Azerbaijani style in Nagorno-Karabakh. Like this, this has got to stop. Like, and the person who's now in a position to stop it because they had the better weapons, because they won this war is Aliyev. If he wants to step up, his wife is vice president and a UNESCO ambassador. She can, that's, you know, it would be remarkable, uh, but it would be a huge step forward. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and I agree. I think uh, this all has to do also with indoctrination in each nation of what is right, how they've been victimized. And that plays a big part um, in this conflict. I do want to touch on Russia. All three of you have spoken about Russia and uh, how everybody's wary of Russian involvement with, in Azerbaijan and Armenia. Putin made a comment uh, to the Armenians about how if they back out of this peace deal, it'll be suicide. So the first part of this is, of course, for Lara, what, what the reaction is on the ground there. The second part is for Leila. And are the Azeris thinking that this could be yes in the future? Putin is already 
staking demand since he has military on the ground? Are they worried that this could be this could lead to ominous future where Russian involvement uh, grows within Azerbaijan? And of course, Jason, uh, if you could chime in on what the Russians are looking for in the region and the broader context of that. Thank you. So before this war, Armenia and Russia were treaty partners. So basically, Russia patrols the Armenian border and secures the Armenian border, especially the Armenian-Turkish border. So if you go to the border, if you go up, I drove up to see the ruins of ancient Ani, it's Russian troops that patrol that border. So Armenia already relied a great deal on Russia for its security before this war. Now, you know, Armenian forces have been decimated. And this was, so, I mean, I can't tell you how much of a city in mourning this is. Thousands of families have lost their sons. Um, and so this feeling that Russia not only dictated the terms of the end of this, didn't really step up and help them. Like there's a big disappointment in Russia, big time. But now they are the force that secures whatever sort of ceasefire there is. Uh, the terms were terrible of the ceasefire for Armenians punishing. And there's real debate here as to whether the prime minister had the right to sign such a deal without parliamentary approval. You know, you can't, it's, it was really, it, it's a bad deal. <laughs> so there's a lot of backlash here against that and a desire to rewrite the terms, Europeans, everyone, even the foreign minister of Armenia, it, it was all a surprise to them. You know, they sort of shoved down Armenia's throat in the middle of the night and then became public. Okay, there's a piece on these very, very, very bad punishing terms, deep losses on the Armenian side. So the past week have been a lot of protests, reactions against the deal, Europeans and others saying we need to rewrite the deal. And this is basically Russia saying, no, like this is the deal we gave you. And this is part of, you know, Russia is remarkably, when it wants to be remarkably consistent, they will want their word to hold and they will want their, certainly their, the, to the extent that this was a win, this whole thing is a win for Russia, they're not going to lose an inch of it. Uh, and so you also have reports of Turkish troops amassing on the border with Armenia and I Igdir, I I'm, you know, really close to Yerevan where I sit right now. And so this incredible vulnerability among Armenians to say, you know, we're cornered basically. So we have to, we're going to have to accept whatever deal this is um, as, as awful as it is. And, and we'll see how the rest of it shakes out. Mm -hmm. um, you asked me about... Um what, how do I see Russian involvement, right? Yeah. yeah yes, um, that's correct. So, you know, there is a tradition of viewing Russia as not a friendly country. As I said, uh, in early 90s, uh, there was a very strong uh, resistance to Russia. So first we got rid of military presence of Russia. Then Heydar Aliyev came and he got rid of energy presence of Russia, squeezed it out. Um, with uh, Ilham Ali, we saw different game. He started to balance between Russia and the West, which uh, helped him to preserve his power by balancing. Um, it doesn't mean that societies, uh, societal attitudes changed. Uh, if you look at the reaction in the society, major civil and political leaders, they all decried Russian peacekeeping troops because that was done without consultations. As you can imagine, unlike in Armenia, where we have uh, permanent consultations with the parliament and other groups, in Azerbaijan it was done by the president, the Russian troops were in. And uh, this is, as I said, this caused a strong, strong resentment in the society. The people continue to react to it negatively. So um, the only way out uh, under the current conditions, as some see, is the counterbalancing by Turkey. Turkey as a NATO member, as the country which is more democratic, has some established democratic institutions like unlike Russia, um, for instance, is seen as more benevolent actor than Russia in Azerbaijan. And uh, if Russia was not there in the ground, probably there was not such a need in Turkey's present. That's the point of view more or less shared in the society. Uh, 
as we agreed in the beginning, uh, this regionalization would not be possible if US or some multilateral, multilateral European institution would be more active actor and would not leave this gap in the region, which was immediately f filled by Russia and now Turkey. So um, uh, we, uh, people do uh, care and they're very concerned about the Russia's presence in the ground because it's uh, definitely for many as the, as the revolutionary leader of the Soviet Union used to say, it's one step forward, two steps back. So bringing Russians, Russians in is two steps back, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Laila. Jason, I want to turn this to you. Uh, I, do, I do want to talk a bit about Russia, but also have a question. Um, is this a continuation of Trump's policies in the Middle East and are countries taking advantage of this? But what I mean by this is we see the administration approving land grabs, approving settlements in Israel. And when we're looking at this, our countries around the world, whether Azerbaijan, Russia, et cetera, look into this and looking at the absence of U.S. leadership. And is this setting a standard, a new standard for the world going forward? And um, last part of this, apologize for putting so many answers and questions in there. But how do you foresee the Biden administration reacting to this conflict? Or do you see any changes at all moving forward? First of all, I'll answer the second part first. One would hope that this isn't, you know, uh, a precedent set by the Trump administration that's going to move forward into successive American administrations. I, I think more than any sort of, you know, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, put out a statement today talking about the Pompeo doctrine. Uh, you know, more than anything revolving around a, a, a Trump doctrine, I think that this is just a, a, more about a lack of American uh, leadership um, and, uh, and sort of turning a blind eye uh, to these sorts of situations around the world. Um, I, I think it, to, 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 the, to the question about how the Biden administration will handle uh, this situation and others, I think it'll be a, a, an attempt to return to the way that we handled our international affairs previously, how we've handled it for decades, more than, you know, maybe almost a century, um, that we will want to promote uh, democratic values and, and uh, push back on authoritarians where we can. And I think that that's what, what's important here. That's what's been missing here. Uh, Russia has been the dominant military, economic, political player in that region for hundreds of years. Uh, and for uh, the last century, uh, they've had to deal with American um, presence, but also American pushback and American ideals, uh, Western ideals. Uh, and, and suddenly, uh, whether or not those ideals that so many of us uh, hold so deeply uh, were ever true or not, now they look really flimsy. Uh, and, you know, if, if you look at the statements coming from Europe uh, about this situation, not very strong. You know, please respect the ceasefire. American uh, involvement is we're going to send, uh, you know, five million dollars of humanitarian support uh, to help uh, displace people. Five million dollars? Really? Uh, I mean, I, I think th this is essentially a slap in the face to the people of Armenia and, and Azerbaijan by the U.S. government. And that's that's what's been going on here. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Laura, I do have a question to you. And, and we did talk about how Armenia is a new democracy. And we all understand the revolution that happened a few years ago. How is this affecting that? Are there people on the ground wanting to go back to the old ways? How is the opposition dealing with the current government? And is there fear within the government that their time could be over soon? So the domestic situation here has been turbulent over the past week. There was a very rough night after this deal was announced. A lot of anger in the streets. A mob stormed into parliament, made a mess of things, beat up one government official. But by day, things pretty much calmed down. That sort of dark mood has not prevailed over the rest of the, of the days that followed. So you still have a lot of protests. Is a combination of grief and anger at the war and, and that it was lost. And the opposition led by billionaire uh, oligarchs, led by um, the former regime, 
to basically call for a unity government where they have a seat at the table. So there was some political opportunism to it. In the days that have followed, there have been much broader calls beyond those, those sort of two for the prime minister of Armenia to resign in all sorts of ways, not to tear down the revolution, not to go back to the old sort of um, oligarchs, but to just, you know, step down, let someone else from your own government step up. Basically, like, we don't want to see your face. You remind us of the war. You didn't do a great job. Um, and so there are a lot of calls for this prime minister to resign. Uh, and so far, he's not willing to. And so that that creates a little bit of concern. How is that going to resolve? Um, is he going to call new elections? He just released a roadmap for rehabilitating the country and supporting the humanitarian crisis. But he's he's really a lame duck prime minister right now. I don't know how he's going to achieve that. Uh, who's going to want to work with him? Even the diaspora is a little weirded out by all this. It's just like, you, you didn't do a great job and you're not really, it's a one man show. So he was a great figurehead for the revolution. He hasn't been an especially capable um, prime minister. He's not our Mandela. I wish he had been a unifier for the country. He hasn't been, he has not been a foreign policy visionary. He has not built a good relationship with Russia. He did a terrible job in my mind um, in terms of the things that Layla was describing, a lot of nationalistic statements, provocations that weren't really necessary. You know, if you weren't ready to fight a war, you shouldn't have gone out on a limb and like, you know, thumbed your nose at Azerbaijan for the two years you were in power. And that's a lot of, at least one year of the two. Uh, he's been doing a lot of that. So he provoked a lot, uh, Azerbaijan. He, he didn't need to do that. He could have been much more of a statement. He wasn't, he's not, you know, bless his heart. He's not a great, he doesn't seem to be really good at doing this, this, this prime minister thing. He's a, you know, oh, he's a journalist. No, no, no knock on journalists, but, you know, it hasn't gone well under his administration. And instead of sort of owning that and putting someone else in, he's really clinging to power. So there's a little bit of concern there. I don't personally see, I hope I'm right. I don't see any real civil strife here. I think the, the bar for a fight in Armenia is very high. I don't think people here are willing to fight over politics. I think he's just going to muddle along for a while. And nobody wants to go back to the old regime. So I moved here in January to work on environmental issues and, you know, teach my kids Armenian. I didn't expect this sort of tumult. So as a result, throughout this whole thing, I have been moving in. So I've been going the past few days to get my couches out of customs and my stuff out here. And it's a really effective bureaucracy now. This wasn't the case before the revolution. Now you take a number. You think, you know, it's super organized. You don't know bribes. Like you wait and turn, you file your paperwork, you do all this stuff. You know, everything from moving in to getting my residency, super organized. In the midst of this terrible, terrible war, society's functioning really well. You know, Armenians are still out doing their daily business, dealing with the COVID surge. You know, and so institutions, a lot of them have held up beautifully. All of them have held up beautifully. And my friends today were telling me it wasn't like this in the old regime. Before the revolution, getting your stuff out of customs was a question of knowing who to bribe, you know? And it's not that kind of society anymore. So there have been steps forward. People don't want to lose those gains. But, you know, no one's really, not a lot of people. We'll find out. There isn't a lot of public polling here. I'm going to struggle to find it. But a sizable number, the, the president himself, the, a lot of the diaspora, people are calling for the prime minister to resign. The intellectual class here thinks he ought to resign and put someone else in from his own cabinet or from the many, many talented young Armenians who've been going to Fletcher and Harvard and all these great schools for the past two decades. You know, there is a generation here that's ready to step up. They're super talented. They're full of ideas. There's enough there to have a lot of hope for the future. But this is a dark, short to medium term picture here. And, if, and again, I mean, Everyone knows someone who's lost their life in this war. And it's a tight-knit society. This really blew a hole in Armenian society. It's going to take time to recover. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Dr. Leila, uh, I, do, I do have a question uh, about Azerbaijan and about their alliance with Israel, especially military alliance. How do people in uh, Azerbaijan feel about that? How do the local population feel about that, knowing how close they are with Turkey and all the issues surrounding the relationship between Turkey and Israel? Well, we have quite lo long and uh, close relationship with Israel, mainly because of the uh, extensive community of uh, uh, Jewish people who used to live in Baku and uh, as um, the leader of Jewish community 
used to say uh, Azerbaijan was the most uh, comfortable country for uh, Jews in all the former Soviet Union. So we, we do have a very good relationship with Jewish community. So when they moved to Israel, of course, that was already a strong lobby. So it's on the societal level. Um, also, the Aliyev's um, very secular uh, policies uh, and foreign policies, um, particularly in regards to Iran, make him very important, makes him very important partner for Israel. Um, also, uh, the energy trade, um, quite a substantial uh, amount of energy trade is uh, goes to Israel, is uh, with Israel. And so there are quite uh, a few very serious um, um, connections between Israel and Azerbaijan. Um, so as I said, it's uh, across sections in the society, it's supported. So um, majority, I don't think they find it uh, unusual or something like that. They find it quite natural. This um, communicate uh, this close friendship and partnership uh, between uh, Israel and uh, Azerbaijan. I think it's due to the old, uh, very old connections, both at the societal level and also at the level of trade. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Leila. Jason, I do have a question for you about the effect of the Armenian diaspora in Washington, D.C. and the U.S. Ha have they done a good job at this? Have they done a good job at lobbying? I know we've seen a lot of uh, uh, people standing up and talking from people on social media, like the uh, Kardashians to politicians. I know we saw the uh, f uh, head coach of the Patriots uh, yesterday make a comment uh, about the uh, the war over there as well. So, but has it actually had any effect on Washington DC? Uh, have you seen any of that working? Again, I mean, we're, we're living through a, such a strange time where you know the the kind of events and lobbying efforts that you see on a on a, a public basis uh, you don't see right now because we're all in our homes. But the truth is, the the you know Armenian diaspora and Lara can help me with the numbers. Uh, you know, is at least three times the population of Armenians living in the country. Am I right about that? Is that is, a, is that about accurate? Roughly. Yeah. I mean, and so, you know, it's a large and uh, influential group here in the United States of America. And I, and I think at a minimum, um, it has um, helped to kind of frame, uh, I would say, the media coverage of this conflict here in the, in the U.S., uh, in favor uh, of Armenia. I think that that's um, something that I've heard people complaining about uh, from, from the Azerbaijani side. Uh, and I understand that, you know, every conflict has two very um, uh, distinct sets of, uh, of needs um, and agendas. But ultimately, I think that the Ar Armenian diaspora has presented itself very well here in the United States and, uh, and made their case. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we are nearly out of time, and I know how emotional the subject is, so I do want to give each one of you a couple of minutes to talk about what your hopes are for the, for the region moving forward. So uh, we could start with Laura uh, uh, and then go to Leila and Jason. You have to really squint your eyes here in Armenia to see the light and to see the hope of this moment. I am that type of person. So I can find the hope in this moment. And it comes in the tech miracle that had been taking place in Armenia. So many successful innovators and startups, so many talented young people, many of them you know, went to war and are coming back scarred or not coming back at all. But you know, Armenians are very good at making something out of nothing. And we will figure out as a people how to recover from this moment. It may feel more like resurrection than even resilience this time around because it was a very hard blow. But I have every faith, every ounce of faith that Armenians will figure out how to move forward and to build a, a better country and a better society. Um, I, I honestly, I, I feel like I have to say and remind people 
there's a diaspora in the world because of the Armenian genocide. We were all displaced persons. I was sitting today at lunch with an analyst. She's Georgian Armenian, I'm American Armenian, but she's from Erzurum and I'm from Gaziantep. And so we're all displaced persons. Practically all of Armenia is displaced persons. Um, this hasn't been an easy century. Uh, when I look at there are plenty of imperfections, including the Armenian diaspora, I mean, they would complain the press coverage has been too Azeri and pro Azeri in other respects, but more importantly, they clearly weren't asking for the right things if they didn't have the weapons and the wherewithal to fight this war. So it is a lot of soul searching and introspection, but I have so much compassion for us as Armenians, I have compassion for us in the diaspora. I happen to be a faithful church going Armenian Orthodox uh, chick, and so my, my mentors in the church will tell me, whatever the imperfections in our community, just remember that we barely got out by our finger, we're barely holding on by our fingernails for the past century. And so my perspective on being Armenian has always been, we're not perfect, but we're precious. And we will preserve what's precious and we'll take it into the future. And only through this conflict, because I've had a lot of Turkish friends and a lot of Turkish contact, that's where I'm from. I'm indigenous central Turkish. In that respect, I'm from that land, and those are my siblings and my former neighbors, and friendships and bonds have formed among my the, the years that I've spent, frankly, covering Syria because it always took me to Turkey. Um, but only in this conflict have I come to even know much of the Azerbaijan story and their experience. Um, and I honestly have a lot of compassion for them too. It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for them domestically. It hasn't been easy for them through this war. I, I feel bad for the people who've died on their side. I'm still, it's hard, even in this, in a post-war moment, in a more moment, it's very, very hard to reach out to the other side and to, and to feel that you're in so much pain, you turn inward like, you know, a turtle in its shell. It's very hard to reach out and imagine and empathize. Um, but I can, if I squint my eyes, I can see it and feel it. And it's not been fair to them either. It's not fair. I'm sensitive to the mosques. I'm sensitive to the people's lives. But I also think we have to stop doing this winner take all and then thumb it in each other's noses thing. Um, and we're going to be looking for the light and looking for the way to build bridges between us and, and them uh, until there's a time when there isn't so much of a strict us and them. Thank you for those. I don't know how we're going to have the right wings, though. Each society has a right wing. I don't know yet how we're going to rein that in because I have Turkish friends. I also know there are far right Turks who would prefer I don't yeah. exist. Period, uh, and they say so, and they cyber attack me, and they do stuff like that. So we're going to have to. It's not easy, but we're yeah. going to have to try. Thank you for those words, uh, Dr. Leila. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for this session and um, I'm very grateful to Lara and to both of you who uh, contributed to this discussion. Um, as a person who is very passionate about democracy, I would say that, of course, democratization is important, but it's not enough. You really need um, liberalization and modernization of the society and opening their minds. And that will mean that you will put the context of the um, current uh, conflict in the other, to the other level, the level of increasing globalization, digitalization, virtualization of the world. Because what Laura just said, it's about young generation, which is very smart and it's in or totally in this new IT business and things like that. And that's what will make us probably uh, less exclusionary, more, uh, we will take the borders more conventional. Uh, we will take the symbols, uh, physical symbols, geographical symbols, uh, much lighter and we'll probably approach it in a, um, best way of a globalized and uh, digitalized world. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. I uh, share your optimism because we, even in the middle of the first Karabakh war, 
the Azerbaijanis and Armenians met on the border during the most intense fighting with a peace mission. And this was not supported or mediated by any foreigners. That was coming from within societies. So I don't tie my hopes with the leaders but I tie my hope with this society and with these progressive, young or not young people, but who can um, approach us from the more broad and more uh, postmodern perspective, maybe. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Leila. Uh, Jason, the final word is yours. Yeah, well, I mean, as somebody uh, who has people that uh, I, I care about deeply living in, in both of those countries and in the, in the neighboring countries around it, um, I also am a lover of democracy, uh, but but I think more important is you know the self determination of the people of these two countries, uh, as free as possible from from uh, foreign uh, intervention and and uh, you know I, I think that that's a, a um, I don't want to say uh, it's an impossible uh, hope, but uh, it's one that we have to help uh, invest in and. and nurture uh, in, in, the, in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Jason. Uh, this has truly been a very insightful panel. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanna thank our distinguished panelists, uh, Lara Sitrakian, Dr. Leila Alieva, and Jason Rezaian for their contribution to today's program, the Nagorno-Karabakh Dilemma. Now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 117 years of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you.